I'm not going to, as a professor at the Harvard Business School, assert that education has a lot to learn from business because I think education is a far more complicated and different context. But what I have been studying uh, since I came into academia was why is it that even in business, fundamental change seems almost impossible to accomplish. And my hope was that if I could understand why it is that fundamental change is so difficult, that might then be the beginning of an understanding of how to accomplish that change. And in the discussion I'd like to walk you through, I'd like to, I, what I hope is that as I go through the models that have emerged from my research, I can bring an answer to three what I would describe as dilemmas facing public education. The first, how can we provide service that, services that are tailored to each child's needs without incurring prohibitive cost? Second, is there a way to improve the productivity of our teachers in terms of more students per teacher without impairing outcomes per student? Third, if spending more money per pupil isn't the answer, and it appears that there's some evidence for that, how can we achieve fundamental change and improvement in our public schools? And although it would be impossible to give answers to each of these three questions, I hope that in my remarks I might give you a way to think your way through these problems to see how, in fact, things that historically have seemed to be contradictory or unachievable actually might be possible if we frame the challenge in a different way. Now, I want to just describe the model that has helped me understand in, in a business context why change, even in those simple applications, is fundamentally difficult. I'm going to plot on the vertical axis the performance of a service or a product over time. Now, the first element of this model is that in every market there's a trajectory of performance improvement that customers are able to utilize. And a good way to visualize this is every year car companies give us new and improved engines, but we can't use all the improvement they give us because you have nuisances roaming around like police that put a crimp on how much of the engine you can put to work. Now, the, I'll depict this ability to utilize improvement as a single line representing the median customer in a market, but if you can remember when you see that, I really mean there's a distribution in every market. So at the high end are very demanding customers that are never satisfied with the best you can give them. And at the low end, fairly simple folks that can be overserved by almost nothing. Now that's the first element of the model, is that in every market there's an ability to utilize improvement. Then the second piece is that in each of these markets there's a distinctly different and more steeply sloping trajectory of improvement that innovating companies provide as they keep introducing new and improved products. The most important finding about this one is that this trajectory of technological perform improvement almost always outstrips the ability of customers to use the improvement. And a good way to visualize this is if you go back to the left side of the diagram there in the early years of the personal computer industry in the 1980s, remember when we were first learning how to do word processing on those early PCs, how often you had to stop your fingers? to persuade the Intel 286 chip to catch up, because it wasn't even fast enough for a simple application like typing. But as Intel keeps introducing faster and faster chips that it can sell for higher prices to more demanding customers in the higher tiers of the market, now on the right-hand side, as they have a 3 gigahertz Pentium 4 processor, they have way overshot the speed that most customers in mainstream applications can use. Now, at the same time, there are still some freaky humans at the high end that need faster chips, but they've overshot what most people can use. Now, some of the innovations that help a company move up that trajectory of improvement are just incremental year-to-year -year engineering advances, while others are dramatic breakthrough innovations. But the breakthroughs and the incremental ones have the same effect on the market in that their purpose is to sustain that trajectory of improvement as it exists in the market at the time. And what we found is that almost invariably the companies that are the leaders of the industry at the beginning of those battles of sustaining innovation find themselves still atop the industry when those battles are over. And it doesn't matter technologically how difficult it is. It just seems like 
if an innovation will help a company make a better product that they can sell for higher profit margins to their best customers, they figure out a way to do it. But we noticed that every once in a while there was a different kind of innovation that came into an industry. And we called this one a disruptive technology. And we used that word disruptive not because it was one of those dramatic breakthrough improvements, but instead of sustaining the trajectory of improvement, it disrupted and redefined it by bringing to the, to the market a product that was simple, convenient, affordable, and according to the metrics of performance that traditionally were used in the market, it actually wasn't as good, and therefore it's positioned below. But it could take root in a simple, affordable uh, application and then improve at such a rapid rate that it then intersected with the mainstream needs a few years later. And it turned out that almost always an entrant company entered the industry and grew up and killed the incumbent leader when one of these disruptive innovations emerged. Now, this is the basic model of how technological change moves through an industry. And I'd like to, to now utilize the model to interpret a piece of business history that maybe some of you have puzzled about. In my own career, I, I spent some of my earliest years in government, and then I founded a company with some MIT professors in the Boston area to make products out of advanced materials. But I always had wanted to be a teacher, so as I approached age 40, I bailed out, became a doctoral student all over again, and, and have now been in academia for about 14 years. The puzzle that led me to academia was just living in the Boston area, watching that huge mini computer company called Digital Equipment Corporation collapse in the early 1990s. Um, and the reason why digital's demise was such a puzzle is that through the 60s, 70s, and 80s, digital was probably the most widely admired of all of the companies in the world economy. They went from zero to 15 billion in revenue. When you read explanations in the business press about why they were so successful, invariably, the success was attributed to the capabilities of the management team. Then about 1988, the company just fell off the cliff and began to unravel very quickly. And when you then read explanations about why the company had stumbled so badly, it was always attributed to the ineptitude of the management team. It was the very same people running the company. So for a while, I framed the question as, Gosh, I wonder how good managers could get that bad that fast. And that really is the common explanation that people have accepted for that company's demise as well as most. And that is a management team that had its act together at one point, found itself out of its league at another. But in this case, it never made sense because every mini computer company in the world collapsed in unison. Digital, Data General, Prime, Wang, Nixdoor, Hewlett Packard, and you might expect them to collude on pricing on occasion, but to collude to collapse was a stretch. And there just had to be something more fundamental going on. And what I'd like to do now is interpret their history through the lens of this model to understand why it is that the incumbents have such an advantage when you're moving up that blue trajectory of sustaining innovation, and why the incumbents seem to be paralyzed when the disruption comes in. So if you were able to bring into this room the sequence of mini computers that digital introduced to its markets through the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and just peeled the covers off the machines to look at the technologies that were acquired to make a good mini computer better, they didn't skip a beat. Anything that was essential to making a better product that they could sell for higher margins to their best customers, they figured out how to do it. But do you remember how crummy those early personal computers were? In fact, Apple sold the Apple II as a toy to children. Not a single one of digital's best customers could use a personal computer because it wasn't good enough. And that meant that the more carefully digital listened to its best customers and tried to reflect the customer's unmet needs in the properties of their next generation product, they got no signal from their customers that the PC mattered because in fact it didn't to them but it could take root in an undemanding application and then improve at such a rapid rate that it intersected with the mainstream needs a few years later. And it wasn't just digital, it was the whole population that got blown out of the, of the water. And it really was not a technology problem. 
digital engineers at the high end were dealing with far more sophisticated problems. They could design a personal computer with their eyes shut. But they had an economic or a business or a profit model. And those of you who remember what those big mini computers were like, they were big even though they were called mini just because relative to mainframes they were smaller. But they were expensive and complicated and they therefore had to be sold direct from digital to the customer. And that selling process involved a lot of training, support, and service. You just had to have costs like that in the business in order to play in that game. And given that kind of an overhead cost structure, digital had to make about 45% gross profit margin on machines that it sold for around a quarter million dollars. And it could make money if it made 45% every time it sold a $250,000 machine. Now in that environment, as in everybody's environment, people were always coming into senior management with proposals to invest in new products or services. Some of those entailed making better computers than digital had ever made before. If you go back and look at those business plans, those plans promised that if they did that, they'd make gross margins on those products of 60% and they could sell these machines for a half a million dollars. Well, at the same time management was trying to decide if they should spend their money to make better products, other people were coming in saying, no, you guys, you don't understand. The future is with personal computers. But if you look at those business plans, in the very best of years, they promised margins of only 40% and they were headed to 20% quickly. And you could only make that 20% on machines that sold for $2,000. And so really, the choice the management had to make was, should we keep moving up the blue trajectory, making better products that our best customers would buy that would improve our profit margins? Or instead, should we use our money to make worse products that none of our customers could use that would ruin our profit margins? What should we do? And uh, it's an innovator's dilemma. Because the paradigms of good management that we teach at places like the Harvard Business School, that you should always listen to your best customers and focus your investments in those areas that help you make the most money, they provide very good guidance to a company that is moving up that trajectory and they paralyze it when it's confronted with the disruption, making it almost impossible for them, for them to change. And of all of the disruptive technologies that have happened, and here's just an interesting list. Some of you may drive Lexuses, you may forget that Toyota started way down at the bottom of the market with crummy, rusty Toyota, Toyota Coronas. Walmart has done it to the department stores. Dell Computer did it to IBM. Um, in the airline industry, the discount airlines are just killing the leading airlines. <clears throat> Some of those that they killed in their day did the same thing, starting at the low end and then moving up. And then there's a whole new set of companies that are doing it today. Basically, any company whose stock you wish you had owned over the last 20 years started at the low end, was ignored by the leaders for perfectly rational reasons, and then moved up. In fact, of all of the leading companies on the blue trajectory that got hit with the disruption, only about 3% of them have made the transition to being a leader in the next wave. 97% have been killed. It's a horrible fatality rate. And as I've tried to understand why it is that such an obvious change in fact, is almost impossible to achieve, in, even in a simple application such as business. I came to understand that there are really three sets of factors that affect what an organization can and cannot do. Now, if you were in charge of an innovation, you would never put a person who is manifestly incompetent to be responsible for that project. And yet, you, 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 likewise, you would never want to put an organization that is incapable of succeeding at a change to be responsible for that change. And this is a way for me to, to visualize when I'm looking at an organization like a school district or a state government or a company, how do I know whether it is actually capable of executing this change successfully? Well, one of the classes of factors that affect what an organization can accomplish are its resources. Resources are things that can be bought and sold and hired and fired. The nice thing about them is they tend to be flexible. So an engineer that's a great contributor at IBM can leave, join a startup, and be a great contributor there. 
Technology developed for telecommunications can be very valuable in healthcare or education. Cash is a consummately flexible resource. The second class of factors that affect what a company or an organization can accomplish are its processes. And processes are ways of working together that have evolved over time to get things done in a reliable and a consistent way. One of the key factors about a process that makes it uniquely different from a resource is that processes by their very nature are meant not to change, but to get the same thing done over and over again. And that means that a process that's good at one thing is bad at another. Then the third class of factors that affect what a company can and cannot do are its values. And I never have figured out a better word in the English language for this because the term value has a bit of an ethical connotation to it. And I mean that, but I mean for something much broader. That is, an organization's values constitute the criteria that people in the organization use when they prioritize one thing over another. And an organization can only prioritize those things that help it survive given the cost structure and economic model that it has. If people prioritize something that are in, that some things that are inconsistent with its cost structure, then it will die. And so by definition, over time, an organization's values become the mirror image of its cost structure, or in a company's terms, its income statement. And that's just the way it has to be. And so if I want to know whether an organization is capable or incapable of succeeding in at an innovation, I need to ask three questions, not one. Number one, does it have the resources to succeed? Number two, will its processes, these habitual ways of working together that have evolved over time to address recurrent tasks, will its processes facilitate what needs to be done or impede that? And then the third one is, will the organization's values allow the people to prioritize this over the other things that are on their plate? So if I were just to go back at digital equipment and ask this question, is digital capable of producing a personal computer? I've got to ask these three. Number one, do they have the resources to succeed? Absolutely. They had more money to throw at that than any other company except IBM. Number two, will their processes facilitate success? And at first I thought, well, of course, they can do complicated computers. Surely they can do simple ones. But actually, it's not true. You know, it took digital hundreds of millions of dollars and four years to design a new computer. To be able to be in the personal computer business, you had to do it in less than nine months with less than $10 million. And it involved stealing intellectual property. And if you looked at digital, they had people who could do that but they didn't have systematic processes that could do that over and over again. And then values. Will the organization's values allow them to prioritize a 20% margin business in machines that sell for $2,000 over a 60% margin business in machines that sell for a half a million dollars? And it just didn't make sense for them to do it. So you come with the odd notion that the industry's most capable organization in terms of resources couldn't do it because its processes weren't designed to do that, nor were it, would its values allow people to prioritize it. And so it, it could not succeed. Now, there are a few examples of companies who've been hit by a disruption who succeeded, but in every case, they succeeded by setting up within the corporate umbrella a distinctly independent organization and giving it a charter to grow up and kill the parent. And when they have done that, then the leaders have been able to succeed. But when they have tried to address the disruptive innovation from within the mainstream company, they always have failed. There's not a record ever in history of one company succeeding because an organization can't do what doesn't make sense to it. Just some examples, IBM is one. They're the only computer company that existed in the 60s and 70s that has survived to this day. And that is when the mini computer disrupted mainframes, IBM set up a totally autonomous organization in Rochester, Minnesota, and gave it a charter to create a different economic model that was tuned to that type of product and a different way to sell to a different type of customers. 
And then when the personal computer disrupted the mini computer, they set up again an independent organization in Florida and gave it a charter to set up a unique economic model that could make money at the price point and overhead structure required for the personal computer business. And the company went through a hellacious time, but they've survived. They're the only computer company that did survive those attacks of disruption, and they did it by creating a corporation that could countenance within it three fundamentally different models for how to make computers and letting them compete amongst themselves. Similarly, when Walmart and Kmart began disrupting full-service department stores, there were 316 department store companies in the United States in the early 1960s. Today, there are only 12 of them left. And the discounters like Walmart and Kmart have grown to, to now dominate that world. The only department store that made the transition from a full service to the discount was a Minneapolis-based company called Dayton Hudson. And what they did is they just set aside a different little company that they called Target, managed it totally independently. And as Target grew and grew, Dayton Hudson continued to compete doing what it was structured to do well. But then little by little, as the discount model has become dominant, the department stores have begun to fade. And thank goodness for Dayton Hudson, they got all of the money that they could earn continuing to improve the current model of department store and yet captured all of the growth that came from the disruption. But they're the only ones that have done that. And in every, every other case, it's a similar story. They survived by creating within the corporate umbrella the opportunity to have different kinds of models to keep playing the sustaining game as long as it needed to be played and then to begin playing a disruptive game separately. Now, I'd like to address a problem with this next, on this next chart that I think is going to confront almost every funding entity at the local or the state level in education. Let me just back up a little bit just, and describe where I think this problem is going to come from. If you look at the set of industries where productivity improvement has been very hard, the inherent inflation rate in those industries is 6 to 8 percent. For example, postal delivery is very hard to make letter carriers more productive. And therefore, if you look at the rate of inflation in postage stamps, it's about 7 percent. Um, the rate of inflation in, of the, in the cost of household help is about 8 percent because it's hard to automate household help. Similarly, the rate of inflation in private college tuition is about 8 percent. And in each of these companies, it's been hard to make individual workers more productive, and that then causes this high rate of inflation. In most companies, the employees get paid 6 to 8 percent more per year, but because those individual employees become more productive, in other words, output per worker increases, the inflation rate of the products they ship is only 2 to 3 percent, but it's because the employees are, are enabled to be more productive by giving them technology that, that causes this to happen. And in fact, output per worker is a key measure of the health of most industries. Well, as you know, in public education, trying to increase the number of students per teacher is anathema to quality. In fact, the, the belief is that if we're going to improve the quality of education, if anything, we have to make the teachers less productive in terms of the students per teacher. And hence, the dilemma that I asked at the beginning is, is it possible to um, make teachers more productive without sacrificing the quality of education? Well, if you're, in, you're facing an inherent inflation rate of 8% per year in the belief that teachers cannot be made pro more productive, then you have only two options. One is increase the budget of education 8% every year, or two is to decrease the amount of education delivered by 8% per year. And my sense is that historically, in subtle ways, we've been choosing the latter. And that is by lopping off the peripheral programs for most of our school programs, course by course and program by program, we've trimmed away what we want might be called fat in order to deal with the constraint of a budget 
and the, the inherent inflation rate of 8%. But my sense is that most school systems are now reaching a point where there's just not a lot more fat or peripheral stuff to be cut. And we're now going to be faced with the choice of delivering 8% less core education or increasing budgets at 8% per year or some unfortunate combination of those two. Or the third alternative is could we conceive of a way to make teachers more productive in a way that would not impair the quality of the education that the students give. And I want to now just come back to the history of disruptive innovation and paint for you a possible pathway for how this trade-off might actually be broken. Now, my disruption diagrams to this point have been shown in a two-dimensional plane. Really what usually happens is the disruption comes out in a third plane of competition. And it doesn't go after the same customers that buy the traditional product, but the disruption competes against non-consumption. What happens is an innovator makes a product so much more affordable and convenient that a whole new population of people can now afford and have the skill to use the product. Almost always, when a possible disruption occurs, the reaction of the leaders in the industry is not to come out and compete against non-consumption, but try to cram the technology into the core market that it serves. And I'll just give a historical example of this. When the transistor first emerged, as a group of companies in today's dollars, they spent about $2 billion trying to make solid state electronics good enough that you could make those products with it. Now, while they were investing in the technology, out here in the third plane of competition, the first application in 1952 was a simple little germanium transistor hearing aid, a tiny little market. Then in 1955, Sony introduced the first portable transistor pocket radio. And those of you with a bit of gray hair, do you remember how crummy those Sony radios were? Horrible fidelity. But Sony decided to sell those radios to the low end of humanity, people we call teenagers. <laughs> and the teenagers were delighted with a, a minimal product because they all, the alternative was no radio at all. And it allowed them to do something that they had always wished they could do, and that is listen to rock and roll outside the home with their friends. And a booming new market emerged in a new plane of competition with new customers. And RCA and the people back in the blue space felt no pain whatsoever. Then in 1959, Sony introduced its first portable black and white 12-inch television. And again, they competed against non-consumption by making it so affordable and simple that a whole new population of customers who historically hadn't had the money or a big enough apartment to have a big floor standing TV now could have one of these little ones. And because it was so much better than nothing, the customers were delighted. But then by the mid-1960s, solid state electronics in this third plane of competition had gotten good enough that now you could start to make big machines with it. And layer by level, they just sucked the, the, the customers from the back plane into the front plane. And within three years, all the vacuum tube companies vaporized. And the punishing thing is that it wasn't that the vacuum tube companies lacked vision because they invest, they saw the, the transistor coming long before Sony did. And it wasn't that they lacked guts. They easily invested 10 times more, mo more money as Sony did to develop the technology. What killed them is that they tried to compete against consumption. And the only way the people in the blue space would have used the new technology instead of the old is if the new was better and more cost effective. And in the 1950s, that was a very difficult hurdle for RCA to surmount. Whereas by deploying the technology competing against non-consumption in this new plane of competition, all Sony had to do was make a product that was better than nothing, and the customers were delighted. And that was a much more tractable hurdle for the technology to get over with. Now, almost always, technology can only be deployed in existing applications in ways that sustain and therefore add cost to the current business model. And that's what the technology did to RCA. And ultimately, after it added all that cost, they, they couldn't change and were killed. Now, my sense is that in trying to make 
teachers more productive by bringing computers in the last, the, into the classroom, what most school districts and most philanthropic organizations have done is exactly what our RCA did. And that is, they've tried to cram computer-based learning into the existing business. And because organizations can only use technology in ways that sustain their current business model, it has not had a transformative effect on the industry at all. Uh, and I'm just going to put together a story that has not yet played itself out, although I'm going to tell it as if it had, just to help you visualize how the model would say new technology could help teachers become more productive. And uh, there is a company out there called Apex Learning, and I'm going to use their name just as a representative of a, a class of companies. They start out by having online uh, advanced placement courses available. I had no idea, but there are 34 advanced placement courses that students could take and pass an exam in. The very best of, of high schools offer seven or eight of these AP courses. Most offer three or four, and a lot offer none at all. And so Apex Learning starts out way on the periphery with arcane subjects like AP Latin or something like that that very few schools offer. And it is so much better than nothing that those students who want it are really quite delighted to have something like that. And then what, what's happening in our school district in Belmont, Massachusetts, is under constant budget pressure, the school board every year rank orders the courses offered in the high school, and the poor teacher that has lowest enrollment in her courses gets her head locked off. And this happens about once a year. So the poor Russian teacher lost her head a few years ago. Two years ago, the German teacher lost her head. And the message to the Christensen family is, well, nice that your oldest three kids got to take German. Too bad that your next two can't, but you should be grateful because we still have Spanish. Well, then Apex Learning comes to the rescue and says, wait a minute. You don't have to not take German. Register for the course, but then that period, go to the library and log on to apex.com. And it is so much better than nothing that an online course is really very good. And the school board, because the online course is so much less expensive than the teacher, they're actually relieved to give that off to the online course. And then the next year, they rank order it, and it looks like the statistics teacher is going to have his head lopped off. And rather than say, well, we don't offer statistics anymore, Apex Learning rides to the rescue and says, no, we've got an online course. Still register your students, but that period, let them go to the library and log on to apex.com statistics. And it is so much better than nothing that it will be welcomed by the student, and it's so much cheaper in a budget crisis that the, the school board will be relieved. And now it looks like after that, the economics teacher's life expectancy is now at about two years. And little by little, competing against non-consumption in an online plane of competition, the technology to provide ever more effective and sophisticated instruction improves. And then it will reach a point where now it is good enough that stuff that we could not conceive being able to teach online is now teachable online. And little by little, instruction is sucked from the back plane into the front plane. And without ever a school board having to make a policy decision to make teachers more productive, in fact, they will have become more productive because the teaching and the learning is transferred much more into a, an individually guided and, and teacher-supervised process and that's the only way that teachers can be made pro more productive by technology is if it is deployed in a way that competes against non-consumption as opposed to the cramming of technology into the classroom that only adds cost and improves performance in an incremental way. Now I just want to say one last thing. On these disruptive diagrams, if you go to the upper left in the period at the very beginning of an industry's history, Almost always the architecture of the service or the product is interdependent and proprietary in character. And interdependent means you can't design one piece of the product until you design the other piece of the product because the way you do this one depends upon the way you did that one. 
and it requires that the companies be integrated. Now, when you have an interdependent architecture, um, customization is impossibly expensive. The economics of interdependence mandates standardization in huge batch sizes. So in that era in the computer industry's history, for example, if you wanted to have a computer custom designed to your individual needs, you would have had to pay IBM roughly $2 billion for that because the economics of interdependence so favor standardization. But on the right-hand side, as the technology becomes better understood, the architectures of the systems tend to be modular in character. And modularity exists when we know how the pieces of the system need to fit together. And when you have modularity, then you can have a Dell computer. That is, you just call them up and say, I don't want this, but I want three of those. And I want this speed, but I don't need that. And they can mix and match and plug and play best of breed components to give every customer exactly what they need. And when modularity characterizes an industry, the welfare of the customers begins to increase dramatically. Well, in education, our current system is essentially interdependent. You can't study this in seventh grade if you didn't study that in sixth grade, and you can't study that in sixth unless you did this in fourth. And the economics of customization in that interdependent system are excruciatingly expensive. And as ESL demands and other demands keep getting laid upon our schools, trying to custom configure an experience to the needs of a, a, a broadly diversifying student base just adds cost, compromises quality, and there seems to be no in, end in sight, and there is no end in sight if we maintain an interdependent architecture. But if technology and online learning can be deployed in this way so that much of instruction then gets, gets done in a computer-based way, that is intrinsically modular. And we can then have our dream of having an educational system that meets every student where they start, takes them as far as they can go, accommodates this learning, life st learning style versus that learning style, deals with, with uh, different language and family backgrounds in an effective way. And in a modular world, there is not a high cost to customization. And I believe that as we look at the challenges that we have in the future, that these, there are a few cliffs hanging out there. And one of them is this cliff of the colliding 8% inflation rate with the budget constraint that mandates that we cannot, we can no longer live with the constraint that teacher productivity and, uh, and, and quality of instruction are irrevocable trade-offs. We've got to break the trade-off. There's a way to do it if we deploy technology in a way that's consistent with the way the world works. And then above all, if within our educational system, just as with the companies that, that have succeeded at disruptive innovation, we create the scope not just for one type or business model of learning, but for the creation of other types of business models, like charter schools and other things, where, where lots of different models can be tested and tried, and we can create the context for continuous improvement. Well, those are just a few feeble thoughts trying to apply some of my insights about what makes innovation so hard in companies and maybe how those same models might help us think our way through some of the challenges of public education. So I guess I'll just sit here, David, and let people shoot barbs and catcalls. The first one is, um, uh, Dr. Christensen, what can state policymakers do to encourage the development of disruptive innovations in education, or are those state policymakers uh, conceivably like those managers of the companies that uh, are they capable of, uh, of reacting to disruptive innovation? Well, it's a great question. Um, you know, if you go back to, in the history of these disruptions, when Sony started introducing that little pocket radio, they had no clue what kind of sophisticated consumer electronics Sony would be making 30 years down the road. But they'd set up a business model that had within, that made those future kinds of innovations easy to achieve rather than hard to achieve because of the 
its, its separateness from what RCA would have been. When companies start out down there in the green space, only about, if you look across all of the sample, only about 7% of them get the strategy right the first time. The other 93% get it wrong, and of those 93, the ones that ultimately succeed do so because they had money left over after they got it wrong to try again. And so I think that if a state legislature, one of the things they absolutely have to do is to create the scope within our educational system for alternative models to be tested. We can't put all of our eggs in the public school basket because of primarily of its interdependent architecture. Um, but if the state were to try to mandate to these people how they achieve the needed outcomes, I think they would probably be wrong. Because in many ways, nobody knows the right formula yet. What we have to do is create a system where innovating institutions can tackle some of these problems competing against non-consumption. And then um, the model will emerge over the course of a number of years. Would you consider uh, choice schools and charter schools to be potentially sufficient uh, alternative models? I would, although I'm not sure that calling it charter and choice and so on um, is the right way to slice it. Because if you create a charter school that competes head on with the public school and tries to be better than a public school in order to, in other words, beat the public school in the race up that sustaining curve, the nice thing about that is that it will create competitive pressures on both sides to make themselves better and better. Um, and a, a good example would be Hewlett Packard when the inkjet printer disrupted the laser jet. HP set up a separate company in Vancouver to make ink jets while it made the laser jets in Boise. And the competition between those two has caused both of those things to become much better and much lower in cost because of that pressure. But what a disruptive charter school would be is probably one that catered, I'm broadly, um, you would broadly describe it as competes against non-consumption. Okay. Taking the troubled students who just can't succeed in the public schools because its interdependent architecture is incapable of delivering a learning style that meets them where they are. And, uh, and by competing against non-consumption, that's really where I think the most important innovations will take root. Okay, thank you. Uh, from the audience, do we have a, a question for Dr. Christensen? Usually there aren't any. <laughs> There's a hand over there, gentlemen. Okay. And please There's identify a... yourself uh, prior to asking your question. Thank you. Norman Sakamoto from Hawaii. I'm in the state legislature there. Um, I guess if, if our traditional measures of performance are like SAT scores, the ability to get into Stanford, Harvard, um, some of the top so-called institutions, and therefore the high school or the school system has been successful, what are perhaps some measures on the disruptive measure, on the alternative measure that, that may be appropriate for us to consider? Well, that's a great question, and I don't know the answer. Uh, I read a really useful book about changing minds by a guy named Howard Gardner at the Harvard School of, um, Public, uh, of Education and the Kennedy School of Government. And I remember he, he described there being eight different learning styles that none of us are really smart or dumb. It's just we're all smart at some things and dumb at other things. And, and we go through phases in our society where a certain kind of intelligence is highly valued, and people who were born with another kind of intelligence therefore feel minimized, and in fact are minimized by society when they have that other kind of intelligence. And one of the things that I think we really need to strive for is to create a public education system that doesn't cram every student into one, one measure of performance that favors one type of student over another, but is flexible enough that people can learn in their own style. And yet it's not sloppy. It pushes every one of them as far as they can go. And that's the reason why I think we, we've, we've got to somehow seek that opportunity by changing the current system. Question over here. 
Uh, Claire Guthrie, Gustin Yaga, Commissioner from Virginia. I noticed the University of Phoenix in your tomorrow column on disruptive technologies, and I wondered if you could comment a little bit about how you see it as a disruptive technology and what its implications are for traditional higher education. Yeah, they're, uh, they're almost shifting into the today column, aren't they? <laughs> I think they have a broader population of students than any other higher ed institution in America. They started out really not as an academic institution, but just providing outsourced skills training to companies whose employees didn't have the adequate skills. And then once you had that institution there, they just, you know, everybody has a, an urge to improve, and they just improve and offer more and more and more. And now, th this is the honest truth, you have um, peop young, young people who have taken their first job out of school, and they look at the exorbitant cost of getting an MBA from Harvard. And they say, well, that would have been nice, but I think I'll just keep working and get my MBA at the University of Phoenix. And those pesky guys are getting a lot better. There's a hand right here at this middle table. Yep. Want to go back first? I'm, uh, I'm Paul Lingenfelder from the State Higher Education Executive Officers. And I'm, I'm struck by the contrast between uh, your strategy for improving efficiency and what we usually do. Uh, most of our discussions are trying to find ways of looking at the things we do most often, the core curriculum, the most commonly taught courses and make them more efficient uh, by using technology and also getting the system uh, better integrated, more aligned, more, inter more interdependent between different levels so that we have sort of a seamless educational process. Uh, how do you, uh, well, what do you think about our, our normal practice and how do you reconcile these interesting, compelling, and competing ideas? Yeah, boy, that's a, another great question. There's a guy named Edgar Schein, who unfortunately taught at MIT, not Harvard. He was a, a, probably a better scholar of organizational culture than anybody that I've ever read. He brought real substance to what's kind of a fuzzy concept. But what he said is if you go back in any institution's history, there was the very first time when a group of people were given a task to address or a problem to solve. And they sat around and scratched their heads and tried to figure out how they were going to get this thing done. And then they went about doing it. If they failed and the task recurred, then they were quite likely to say, well, let's not do it that way again. Let's try something else. And so they try it a different way. And if they succeeded and the task recurred, they were quite inclined to say, well, it worked that way last time. Let's do it again. And if they succeeded again and the task recurred, they would be even more inclined to do it the same way. And so the more successfully a group of people uses a way of working together to address a, a recurrent task, and the more repeatedly they do that, they then come to a point when they don't even ask how they ought to do it anymore, but they just assume that that's the, that's the way it ought to be done. And when people be, begin to adopt a way of working together or a set of so processes or values, what's important and what's not important, when they adopt processes and values by instinct and assumption rather than explicit debate, it becomes part of the organization's culture. And that's what culture is, is it's processes and values that historically have been used so repeatedly and successfully that people now just assume that that's the only way to do it. And the etiology of that is the task that recurred over and over again. And part of the relief that I've experienced as I've gone through this study is the, the understanding that moving up that sustaining curve is not a stupid thing to do at all. In fact, it's smart. In fact, it's required. And so the reason why you expect, why you see schools continuing to try to improve within the existing system is because the culture says that that's always the way you solve that, that set of problems, which, and that's rooted in the kinds of tasks that our public schools were confronted with a, a century ago. And if you're going to change an organization's culture, Shine says, you actually need to create a different organization, give those folks a new set of tasks, and then let them develop a process for addressing that new set and do it over and over again. So it's, uh, and I guess one last thing, 
the new game always begins before the old game is sick. And so it's not a question of just shutting down or reforming the old and then throwing all of your baskets, your eggs in the new basket. You just have to keep cultivating the old and making it as good as you can. But if you just banked that that was going to be the solution to all of the problems in the future, you'd be crazy in any context. And the fundamental change can only happen when you create fundamentally new institutions. I guess that's how I think about it. We have, by the way, been given clearance to continue till 2 o'clock. The afternoon concurrent session started at 2.15, so you will have a little bit of time between there. We have a question here. I'm Kristen McGuire. I'm from South Carolina, um, the State Board of Education. And my question is, when you look at the two graphs, um, there's that un underserved or non-consuming portion. And the unique problem or challenge that we have in public education is that the consumer is really a captive consumer. The non-consumers are those that are in private school um, or homeschooling. They're already exercising that they've opted out. Um, what is the critical mass of a non-consumer that we need to get into that market that we can start seeing the innovations move up the scale fast enough to cross the line? Well, I would say there's, there are several classes of non-consumption. One of them is, is as uh, school districts strive to meet the standards that are set by No Child Left Behind and so on, and, and again, the economics of interdependence compel them to standardization, there are actually a lot of students that the school districts would love not to have. And they create then alternative schools or, or institutions to take those students. And rather than having them be babysitters, this actually is a great place where new technology can be cultivated and they can move up. And then what you see over time is those institutions figure out how to address that. And because it is so much better than the alternative, the performance of those will be judged to be very successful. So that's one type of non-consumption. Another type is homeschooling. You actually see a lot of the, the the valuable technology deployed in that context in a disruptive way. And the third are the peripheral kinds of courses that are getting lopped off by the school boards. It's just there's a particular class of places where internet-based learning is very likely to take welcome root. And a, another class of places where internet-based learning will be cost additive and incremental in character. And we're so short of money that we always ought to deploy it over there? That's a great question. You know, it occurred to me when you were uh, talking about, um, uh, about efficiency of, of the teacher, that maybe there are sustaining innovations that still could be utilized in our current system. And, um, and, and I'll just think out loud of one that, that may provoke a few people. But uh, a couple of years ago, when I was a senior in high school, uh, <laughs> The, um, the science class I was in had about 30 students. The very next year, as a freshman at the university, I was in a science class of about 200 students. So ha have we considered all the options at, at the high school level right now of potential sustaining innovations? I wasn't that much more mature, and I was certainly far more in, in a potentially independent and, uh, situation. That's a great point. Um, you know, digital equipment would have been nuts to have shut down the mini computer business and just thrown all of their eggs in the PC basket because there were billions of dollars to be made on the sustaining trajectory of mini computers before the switchover happened. And so I don't mean in any way to say we ought not pursue every conceivable sustaining innovation in our public schools. But I do think that it's very realistic to say that if we want a fundamentally different learning model, the evidence is just overwhelming that the current institutions cannot do it. And it's not that the people inside of those institutions can't do it. It's the context causes the change not to make sense. Another question? Over here. John Antell, University of Houston. Um, your, at least your business history model has a happy ending, at least a happy ending for consumers because uh, you assume uh, free entry and exit. But uh, with the industry we're talking about here, um, that might not quite be true. Could you talk a little about, we, we know a little about entry. You talked about the University of Phoenix. But what about exit? 
uh, how are we going to reallocate those resources in the current context in, in, uh, where resources, resources, resources are allocated by a public institution? I'm just curious how you might modify yeah. your model. Well, I'll just think out loud because, as I mentioned at the beginning, I really do think public education is a very different and more complicated animal. But um, when, um, for example, Hewlett Packard in computers is getting disrupted by Dell, and the way they exit is they just shut down this factory and then they shut down that factory because they have not, they, they didn't set up a separate organization to compete head on against Dell in the way they do, do their work. And so I would never expect a municipality or a state to exit the education business. But I would expect that individual institutions, a school, for example, might find that it just can't keep pace with the new change. And so we find ourselves saying, well, it's, it's lived its useful life. Let's not keep investing in something that is not as good as this new thing. And we'll just gradually shift resources from one to the other. And so it, it, I, I wouldn't imagine that a school system would be transformed in a decade, but maybe in three decades, little by little, the new will, will grow and the new models will become dominant and the old ones either will accept the new or ultimately fade away. But that's the process that I would think would happen. We have one here from table two, Governor Shaheen, I think. <laughs> Thank you, I'm Jean Shaheen. I'm the former governor of New Hampshire. In New Hampshire, we could look at individual school districts and say, uh, this particular school district was being very successful and this particular district wasn't. So as you looked at your business, different businesses, um, you didn't look at the private sector as a whole. You looked at individual businesses. So have you looked at individual educational entities, whether they be the LA school district or the state of New Hampshire or the University of Massachusetts and said the same thing is happening in those individual entities as happened in the businesses that you studied? Well, not as deeply, Gene, as, as I should because I'm really just trying to move in this direction. But you see it happening in a significant way. For example, I, I gave a talk to a group of university presidents at, Asp, presidents at Aspen a couple of years ago. And one of them said, do you think community colleges are disrupting four-year institutions? And I was clueless, but the president of the University of Michigan raised his hand and he said, you know, I never thought about this, but last year in our graduating class, 80% of the graduating bachelor's degree students had taken some or all of their general education at a community college. And he said, just in an unwitting way, we just handed that off to the community colleges, which can do it for much lower cost than a four-year research institution. And we've moved up into higher upper division and graduate education. And then a lot of the community colleges have gone from a fairly simple two-year structure to now becoming four-year degree-granting institutions who, because they're not burdened with research costs and so on, can actually teach at a much more cost-effective level. So you see this kind of stuff happening here and there, but I think it's more um, prescriptive rather than a historical study. But I would love to study this if any of you guys are interested in trying to apply it to individual institutions. It is happening to the business schools in a significant way. We have one more, one more question, please, right here in the middle. Uh, I'm Giselle Huff with the Jacqueline New Foundation in San Francisco. Um, in your book, you make it very clear that those who were successful in spinning off uh, the innovations and starting new companies um, invested a great deal of money in doing that. I mean, they made a commitment, a financial commitment at the corporate level to do that. When you look at the, uh, the charter school, for instance, movement, um, that is not what is happening. That is, it's being um, treated as you know, a stepchild in terms of funding, and it's being fought against in many different venues politically. 
So how does a, uh, an institution like the education system take on that same, um, you know, the same position that the business people did, where they just bite the bullet and say, okay, we're going to try these things, but we're going to try them in the right way and not just half-heartedly? Well, it's a great question. Um, I, I would say two things. Number one is that an organization cannot disrupt itself. In other words, the people in an organization cannot take actions that make no sense given the context in which they're working. And therefore, the, the, dis, the decision to create another institution that has the potential to disrupt can only be made at the level above that, that organizational unit. So in a company like Hewlett Packard, that decision has to be made at the level of the board and the CEO, not at the level of the business units. And in our context, the decision really must be made at the level of state funding. And again, the, to create space for people to innovate, not to dictate to them what those innovations ought to be. We can tell them what the standards are, but not how to achieve the standards. So that's one thing, is that it really is the role of the board of directors of, the, of education at the level of the state. And I can't remember what the second idea was, but you should be relieved that I forgot. Please join me in uh, thanking Dr. Christensen. <laughs>